ladies and gentlemen welcome again to another edition of the hotbull tuesday webinars uh, we are we are fortunate to have uh, dr subhashi shah with us this time uh, he has been uh, a person who has taken to uh, urodynamics and uh, reconstructive urology and bladder physiology since a very long time and probably one of the people in our community who has started this probably you know uh, for, very very far back so he's built up a very rich experience and also i've heard him speak on this before so it's always interesting to hear so i thank him for having accepted our invitation to come and speak at this uh, forum uh, the advantage we thought about this kind of a thing was that there is adequate time to discuss so there are no caps of 15 20 minutes we can take the time that we need to discuss things and discuss issues and then uh, you know take it forward from there so that was the thought behind this and i do hope that it has been of benefit all these talks are available on our iaps uh, uh, youtube site if you go to youtube and search for iaps society uh, all these talks are there along with those that have happened in the past as well uh, so without much ado i invite dr subhashi sa who is a pediatric surgeon and urologist at amdi hospitals in calcutta uh, to take over please thank you sir Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, an honor to be able to share with this August audience uh, virtually uh, our experience and thoughts about the importance of bladder evaluation and management in pediatric urological practice. So, in the very beginning, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of my teachers in pediatric surgery, Professor Vishnu Mukhopadhyay, Professor Chiran Das, Professor Pradeep Mukherjee, Dr. Shamanto, Professor Ravi Kumar, sir. Professor Sudeep Tose and many others along the way uh, for the last thirty years have always received the help and guidance of so many seniors across our country and abroad. And as we all know, that it's a teamwork. And uh, basically, uh, at the end of today's lecture, I think uh, some more and more youngsters would uh, take it as a challenge to take this up. This particular bladder evaluation can itself develop as a super speciality. And uh, some of you will be encouraged to take this up in your. Sanjay, request you to mute everyone. There is lot of disturbance. Yes, madam, I am doing that as I see people coming on uh, live. So it's a process that I am continuously doing. Uh, so I, I will, I will keep an eye. So I would uh, like to acknowledge my team. Uh, I have a great team. I am really fortunate in working with. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Sena, Dr. Shushmita Banerjee, who are pediatric nephrologists for excellence for the last 30 years, I have learned from them how to metabolically take care of the metabolic issues of the CKD patients. And of course, I should acknowledge the uh, uh, help of Dr. Poonam Guha Vase, who has been a part of my team for the last couple of years. I mean, uh, it's her not only her enthusiasm in taking up this workload of pediatric urodynamics, but It was because of her diligence and efforts, despite her busy practice, that we could publish some of our works uh, over the last so many years and our realization. So, in these few words, I'd uh, like to share the presentation. And uh, so, so bladder assessment in pediatric urology. That was a topic for today. So now bladder evaluation is not a very fancy thing. It doesn't require out of the box uh, this thing. So basically, it starts with history taking, as for any other clinical uh, examination, I mean, any other clinical scenario. So it's very important uh, to take note of uh, the basic tenets, like whether there are any obvious symptoms like urgency, like holding maneuvers, because we see so many children with bladder bowel disorders these days. now those children actually if you just talk uh, very uh, diligently you will find that they have holding maneuvers starting way back from childhood and that ultimately culminates in a severe bladder uh, is deformity so history taking about the uh, level of aneurysis if there is a sudden onset aneurysis if there is any difference in the flow of urine if uh, these infective episodes this uti episodes are related to some Uh, I mean, as I already discussed, the constipation. Then there are issues with uh, previous treatment, previous management of uh, surgery. Su I mean, surgical management, medical management, and so on and so forth. As far as clinical examination is concerned, the things which are missed usually is examination of the back, because often we have found 
children coming out with severe VOR who actually have a spinal bifida could be an occult one. So examining the gait, examining the inner tone, all these things actually add to your repertoire of examining properly a, a child with neurological issues. Regarding ultrasound, I'll just rush through all these basic tenets. Ultrasound, we all know, but uh, actually you have to talk to the radiologist yourself and train him or her into how to assess, especially for a, a, a urological uh, evaluation. It needs a, not only an ultrasound, it needs a renometry. You have to exactly measure the cortical thickness, the calicial diameter, the epidiameter, transverse diameter of the pelvis, whether ureters. And one more very important thing, uh, if you just apply color Doppler and put your probe on the bladder for a while, you can see the ureteric jets. So these are the things which are actually easily can be done, but the lack of orientation sometimes uh, we, we, we uh, don't find uh, reports according to our wish. The bladder thickness, often it's not me me mentioned. So it's just said that uh, thick bladder. So exactly we need to measure the thickness when the bladder is half full, optimally full. So in an empty bladder, in a collapsed bladder, always it will look thicker than when it is op optimally distended. So you should take that measurement. Then you can even measure the posterior urethra, the diameter of the posterior urethra, and if there are any diverticuli, etc. So now we come to the basic thing, that's the functional bladder evaluation. Now functional bladder evaluation need not be always uh, extremely invasive, like a urodynamics. Now, even looking, as Dr. Sain used to say, just looking at the child who is peeing, is a uroflometry actually, in your front. You can just observe at your lab, at your toilet, which is next to your examination room. So even looking at the child peeing will give you a uroflometry. And avoiding diary is actually a very simple uh, tool, which is done without any cost. And nowadays, because of this internet, uh, because everyone has access to internet. And so you can obtain the voiding diary even on phone. There are apps which give you voiding diary updates. So voiding diary actually can uh, give a provisional diagnosis in a good number of cases, as, as, as high as 40 to 50%. And uroflometry is another non-invasive thing which can be done over the counter at your OPD without any uh, invasive maneuvers and without frightening the child. The child can easily do an uroflometry. And uroflometry with EMG gives you such a good result, which often even is comparable with urodynamic study. So urodynamic study is something which is a last resort and, and, and which is ultimately, uh, it can be done easily. And if you combine a fluoroscopy with a urodynamic study, it's, it's just hitting two bulls with one bullet. I mean, you don't need a separate MCU. The overall radiation exposure is much lower. And you get exact correlation of uh, the structural and the functional problem of the bladder. The moment you see there is a reflux, the reflux might not be a continuous reflux. You, you just, if you correlate, you'll find exactly, we'll show in our presentation that when the bladder pressure is, there is an overactivity, there is a reflux. So you can exactly correlate what's happening if you do a video hydrodynamic study. So, in a nutshell, whenever we manage patients with posterior urethral valve, Vesicoiliatural reflux, any suspected case of proven or suspected neurogenic bladder and non neurogenic neurogenic bladder, a commonly presenting bladder bowel syndrome, it's mandatory that we evaluate the bladder function in whatever we can, way we can. Oh, Excuse me. Okay. So, We'll start with a female infant with recurrent UTI. Now, this was a one-year, three-month-old child, one-year, five-month female child, had many, many episodes of, five episodes of febrile UTI in one year, five months. Now, since she was two months of age, this had repeat, you know, she needed three admissions. Out of these five episodes, three cases she needed to be admitted. So we got hold of the child. We were referred when the child was admitted for the fifth time, this female child. Now, the child had good urinary flow. It was almost every hour. So there is an element of frequency. And occasionally there was intrapter stream, which is I mean, often common at this age. It's a soft stool daily, so apparently there is no history of constipation. The sound showed a normal study, done upside. So we did a, a, a prophylactic with uh, prophylactic antibiotic coverage, we did this aerodynamic study. Now, if you look carefully, the bladder neck is opening well, and there is a bladder contour is also more or less fine. 
So if you look at both these pictures, I'm sorry, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so there is complete emptying and uh, there is a grade five reflux. And if you look carefully, this particular film, you'll find intraparenchymal reflux. Now, these are the things you have to train yourself and your radiologist to look at it. So that tells you that there is this little more severe reflux, this intrarenal parenchymal reflux that's visible here. So we did a aerodynamic study and a video aerodynamics. And you can see that uh, more than, this is a one year, three month. So we are expecting at least uh, 60, 70 ml capacity. And you will find these spurts of overactivity. And what we found is exactly during these spurts of overactivity and overactivity reaching up to 50 centimeters, up to 70 centimeters of water. And these are the spurts when there is reflux. So there are situations, there are uh, moments where there is no reflux during filling as well as voiding. But during these spurts, we find that there is a severe reflux. So this is a, and, and most important is uh, when you are doing an aerodynamic study in a small child, you have to be mentally prepared that you might have to do a second study, you can have to do a third one. So you, time should not be a barrier. It's not that I have to finish the entire study in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So you have to keep the entire time at your disposal. And you might have to repeat as many times as needed to get a clear picture. So basically now, this is the second case. So basically in the first, uh, first patient here, the idea is now we should not rush in to treat the reflux, whether by deflux or by surgery or whatever. So this is where our entire understanding has gone a sea of change over the last decade. Even seven, eight, ten years back, we used to uh, do n number of ureteric green plant or deflux or vesicoscopic green plant and all that stuff. But over the last three, four years, our numbers have drastically reduced because now we have realized that most of, almost 70% of all pediatric DUR are actually secondary. So there are two issues. So if you treat them surgically, or you try to cure the reflux, there is a high chance of recurrence. And many children have come to us with recurrence after following surgery and at some other places. And the second thing is, most of them, as we will show in our presentation, if you properly treat the bladder, if you improve the behavior of the bladder reflux, just simply vanishes. So this understanding is completely different. And that this video aerodynamic studies or bladder studies have helped us in getting this realization. Now, this is our second child. This is a three-year female child presenting with recurrent UTI. Now, they were completely fed up because they were severe intractable UTI since the age of six months. Repeated episodes, repeated episodes, repeated uh, hospitalization. Now, the child did have a huge right gross VUR, as I will show you in the next picture, MCU. And the right kidney was non-functioning. On an EC scan, it showed almost zero function. Now, very interesting is this is how history is important. Now, this child had a history of straining while passing urine. And each time, she used to pass a very small amount of urine. Now, many, uh, I mean, she had other consulta previous consultations before coming to our uh, clinic. And, and many, uh, many of the surgeons, urologists, they had advised uh, nephrectomy. Now, what we did, this was a picture. This was the MCU picture when we did the MCU. Now, what we did was, we didn't go for, we did a nephrectomy, of course, on the right side, because it was just a bag of water. There was no cortex, renal cortex, just a papery thin. But we left a portion of the ureter, lower ureter behind, right ureter. Reason was that we could, because here you see, if you look carefully, in none of the pictures, you find that the bladder neck is open. Bladder neck is closed. Bladder neck is closed. Bladder neck is closed. So in none of the pictures on the MCU, you find that there is a good, nice urinary flow with a conical shape at the bladder neck. So this is something about the MCU, which uh, we didn't use to actually notice uh, a couple of decades back. So when, whenever you look at an MCU, this is one more thing you should look at, that whether the bladder neck is chronically it is in spasm. So that actually tells you that there is a possibility of a, a secondary reflux or secondary, I mean, rise in blood pressure 
get to sustain the disenergy and you need to uh, look at address that so this child was treated with the right nephrectomy with preservation of the lower ureteric stump as a neurotrostomy so what happened after that she has been passing urine mostly through the neurotrostomy and occasionally periurethral the ultrasound has remained normal in the sense that the left moiety red renal moiety was preserved the structural integrity and the functional integrity was preserved and then we did a urodynamic study under fluoroscopic guidance to evaluate the blood after a while after 6 months so this clearly shows that during the urodynamic study the bladder was rounded and smooth that's a very nice looking bladder and during voiding contraction there is a small amount of contrast which is passing through the ureter it's very thin film thin film extremely thin film but a huge mo the moment the bladder is contracting there is a rush of urine through the ureterostomy so basically in this particular baby the ureterostomy possibly saved the other kidney from deterioration and saved the child from going into ck so this was a urodynamic study as you can see this is a normal capacity bladder compliance was normal this is all at the baseline but here it is going up so there are bursts of overactivity and during all that time the sphincter is chronically during this entire thing sphincter is chronically uh, active so there is a very small amount of urine if you see the euro flow there is almost zero <laughs> almost zero but here this chronic this these are the sphincter spasms and this is the area of overactivity but generating a almost negligible flow this is a zero flow is zero so if you look at this video you will find this is a uh, video aerodynamics so you can just appreciate so, so the flow across the urethra is extremely thin and during this entire period the urine is going up across this is a uh, stoma we had created the cerebrotrostomy so what we did in this child we did a cystoscopy and what we found was uh, uh, there was a extremely tortuous ureter although this is very interesting that we had done a cystoscopy at the beginning when the child was presented to us that was at two and a half years at that time ureter was uh, unremarkable when we repeated this thing when we uh, planned the therapeutic thing and did the cystoscopy we found that the ureter was tortuous a lot of spasm of the internal sphincter the bladder was trabeculated part of the right trabeculation this is a bladder neck this is a bladder neck and the urethra is actually extremely tortuous so we did a urethral dilatation and we injected botox in the sphincter as well as the bladder neck so this is uh, the 6 o'clock and of course the child was put on alpha blockers and anticholinergics so what we find one year later now she is on urotherapy she is on four hourly cic to the ureterostomy and night time drainage we have started her on mirabegron and uh, high dose of alpha blockers titrin now what is happening gradually 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 she is now four and a half years she is sometimes at times passing urine in stream and in between the cic occasional there is some leakage of urine not leakage she passes urine she says that i am she has full sensation and in between cic episodes she, she sometimes passes urine occasionally and sometimes she passes urine in good stream she has been infection free since the time we started treating her that she one underwent partial i mean nephro ureterectomy and she is on a solitary kidney which whose functional and structural integrity has been maintained till date so we are still undecided about what to do with the ureterostomy but that is the present status so basically the entire idea of uh, relating this child was child coming with a, a high grade reflux and non functioning kidney on one side if she can be a, having a lot of issues with the bladder which is actually the primary disease in this case so she might even uh, we have counseled the parents that she might need complete closure of the bladder neck and a permanent mitrofenol i mean that's one of the options because if this thing does not improve finally 
the uretral contour does not improve finally. We have enough time to, uh, to, for trial also, but that is one of the options. So entire spectrum should be very clear before you when you suggest the treatment and you have to see long term that, uh, so preserving the ureter, uh, that we did not think much while doing that, but later on it proved to be very beneficial. So this is another story. Uh, now, we have around 170 plus patients of posterior valve, which we have treated from 2000 onwards. Now it's almost 24 years. So these are the patients, uh, like, like this patient. This was a child who, whom we had did the, we managed, he was born in 2004. Now, it is an antenatal detected urinary tract dysfunction, uh, dilatation with oligohydramnios and raised creatinine. So it was a very bad PUV to begin with. Now we did the fulguration on day three of life and put him, at that point of time, we used to put almost all children on uh, tropan, oxybutynin, all cases of bad bladder. So the child was on oxybutynin for a long time and such a bad uh, case, ultimately, uh, this was uh, uh, in 2016, I'm sorry, we fulgurated in 2009, now, 2016, even on tropan, this was a, a filling, filling systematry. And in 2017, it was almost reached the baseline. We stopped all medications, uh, oxybutynin in all around 2009. Now, the point is, uh, now he is an adolescent, and we are actually now calling back all our adolescent UV patients. Now, this child did not have any symptoms, not having the symptoms in the sense that his ultrasound was absolutely normal, normal bladder, no residual volume, kidneys preserved, normal looking kidneys, mild dilatation of the upper tract, kidneys is a baseline. So, starting such a bad case in infancy, going on to adolescence, having a normal. Now, this child was not in our regular follow up group. The sense that beyond 2017 18, we said you come to us every two, hours, two years, every three years. Now in 2020, later half, we have to, we plan to call all our patients who were now adolescent and do a video aerodynamics in all of them to see what happens. Now herein lies the interesting thing. Now here, now routine evaluation at adolescence, we found that this was the MCU. You can find a very nice contoured bladder, a complete voiding. Urethra has almost become normal. But here you can see a slight uh, constriction at the junction of posterior and anterior urethra. Bladder neck is opening well, but uh, there is no proximal dilatation. But possibly it was normal. The child didn't have any complaint regarding the flow. So stable renal, renal parameters, apparently asymptomatic, good urinary flow, no PVR, bladder wall normal on ultrasound. No upper tract dilatation, no UTI. Stable renal parameters. So all these taken together, is some years back used to tell us that it's absolutely fine. So when we went for this Eurodynamic study, this was the Euroflow. Now anyone who has any experience with doing or reading an Euroflow meter will tell you that this is an obstructed problem. The child is asymptomatic, so what do we do? Now this was one of those children where we did not do a check cystoscopy ever because we thought that everything is falling in place and we don't need to work up at all. Then we did a, we found a poor if free Euroflow pattern and we suggested that check this person. Or rather, before that, we did a video UDS. That is showing, if you look carefully, that there are bursts of overactivity here, 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 and there is high pressure voiding. This is also another area of uh, our work that previously boiling pressure during Euroflometry was not considered of any significance in children. Now, uh, uh, we have a publication in this year's, this issue of JIBS where we have actually uh, correlated our observation of boiling pressure. And now we believe that even very high boiling pressure gives you an idea of aerodynamic outflow direct obstruction. And another thing is, if you look at the flow, you see that the detrusor pressure However, it is not sustained. So there is some flow, again it fails. There is some flow, again it fails. So 
traditionally we have been taught that this is the area this is the time during adolescence where myogenic failure sets in but that's once again uh, into question now because we have found a couple of such patients who were apparently leveled as myogenic failure we did a check cystoscopy and we did some intervention like this child had a residual valve so we did a laser fulgurish uh, laser vaporization of this residual valve and what happens after that this is the euroflow we did it in august uh, september 2021 this is a 22 euroflow this is a july 23 euroflow and now retrospectively the child is saying he is saying that he has a fantastic urinary flow now and the urinary flow had all along been a little dubious he used to tell his parents his parents used to say no no it's fine it's fine so he now feels that he has a much better urethra but this was one of the child where we have one of the children where we had apparently thought that everything is fine so another of this sort of group this is a 10 year child this child was operated at age of 1.1 year 6 months assess it in a good stream but look at carefully we have a history of urgency we have a history of urge incontinence we have a history of wetness of pants not occasionally but almost every day during the day and there is diarrhea and nocturnal and it is but the parents are happy the point is but these symptoms on history taking tells you that there could be something wrong now what does the usg tells you it sounds shows you that it's a normal upper tract that other one is good 1.8 mm previously when he came to us 6 months back it was 2.9 so with minimal medication it's improved Post void is only 20 cc at 10 years of age, but rectal diameter is 32 mm. Now this is another thing which can be added to a standard ultrasound. Like our radiologists always measure rectal diameter, transverse rectal diameter when they do any case of ultrasound of kidney or the bladder. So without any radiological exposure, you get the benefit of assessing the status of constipation. It took us almost one and a half years to standardize. so we used to do x ray as well as do ultrasound so now our radiologists know what is how to measure a rectal diameter and that's standardized now if it's a uh, it's big so you know that the child is constipated and that can affect the bladder function another very very important tool as i discussed in my first slide is the voiding diet now it is uh, been completed here actually this voiding diet is showed leakages in all these almost all these columns had leakages so amount of urine passed this much but before that and after that there was a leak and it was wet same here and you see the amount of I mean, the frequency this child this is a 10 year child is voiding almost 12 to 13 points so this tells you that overall taking everything together there is something wrong this is the euroflow entry so he passed 170 value urine in a good stream Two bags is good, no BVI. So apparently, everything is fine. Now, urodynamic study shows that the capacity is one thirty mL. Now, at ninety mL, we had to stop. Ninety mL of filling, we had to stop the uh, study because there was intense urge to evacuate. The compliance is normal; it's at the baseline, but there is significant overactivity. now in all the first study second study you will find there is significant overactivity pressure is going up to 30 cm and only at 60 ml of filling so now if you just correlate all the things this entire so many times he is wetting his pants so you have to visualize that all that time around in 60 to 70 ml filling there is an overactivity and there is that is leading to the urgency and that is leading to the leakage and the urodynamic study actually and what we noted was during each dead to sir contraction he has an urge to pass it so this urgency leakage enuresis everything can be explained in this single study and the picture is more or less clear so if you see the voiding curve capacity is small ideally so it's a shrunken little shrunken bladder that also tells you now all overactive bladders are little shrunk if it's a good capacity bladder usually overactivity is absent so that's an another i mean back calculation that a small capacity bladder with overactivity that's absolutely tally is actually now we what we did was we actually treated the child with medications 
And now at the end of say, uh, uh, maybe around eight, 10 months of medication zero therapy, we have a child where the bladder is rounded. There is no viewer. There is no residual valve, but the bladder next looks pretty wide. Now, we are not sure why this is. So this is another area of doubt. But basically with medications, you can stabilize the bladder and all those things. So we, this was our plan for the time being. And even just management of the constipation and adding a little amount of medication, actually, entire uh, uroflometry changed. This is uroflometry. Now, that is on June, 20th of June. You find there is no leakage on one day and the other day there is once leakage of once or twice, very little amount. And the entire frequency has come down and the voiding volume has increased. Here there is 300. Previously, all the voiding volumes were 130, 140, 60, 70 like that. Now it's almost 300, even 500. So that's the change you can create. But apparently, and this is the Euroflow, recent Euroflow, and it shows a pretty good thing. It's previously completely sort of obstructed. And here there is a good Euroflow. Now, this is another child, uh, very small, young child. So those two were very adolescent. Now, this is a three-year, eight-month child with posterior valve. Now, this was the original uh, uh, antenatally diagnosed once again and fulgurated at the age of two days. There was one episode of UTI at one year, now doing well, passing urine in good stream, but occasionally wet cyst band. Now, stooling pattern is normal. So the point is, this was the original MCU. And now this is the clinical picture. So apparently we should have been happier. Uh, everything is fine. So there is uh, no UTI now, passing urine in good stream, sleeping well. So, so this was our, we wanted to investigate. So we did uh, one MCU and one UDS, video edit and So we find that there is little upper tract dilatation. The bladder wall thickness is 5 millimeter. Most of the void is 50 in a, a three-year child. The voiding diary is usual volumes are 60, which is actually on the lesser side. So UDS shows the capacity of 136. Compliance is reduced. It's 10 centimeters at 80 filling, 80 ml of filling, and 13 at 110. Of these overactivity is going up to 80 centimeters. And after sets only up to 70 ml, you see 60, 70 ml, 80 ml fleeing, there is a severe burst of overactivity. The voiding curve, this is an enlargement of this voiding curve. It shows normal voiding pressure, normal flow rate, complete emptying, normal velocity. So there is a slight discordance at the filling cycle. So what options we have? Uh, we may not do anything, but Actually, we prefer doing, in such discordant cases, we prefer doing a check cystoscopy. Or we need to put the child on other blockers or anticholinergics or both. And if everything fails, in that case, we might have to go further. Now, this child, we underwent a check cystoscopy and found a residual valve. Though apparently, clinically, he was doing well. Now, we are gradually moving into uncharted territory because as you have already told you we have been a part of now since we have uh, uh, in our association pediatric nephrology colleagues we are now seeing children who are undergoing renal transplant so uh, so we supervise the children we prepare them for transplant and then they undergo renal transplant by the transplant team so this is a 12 year old male who consulted with a ckd and preparing for transplant. Now, this is a very interesting uh, story. The story goes back to 2011, when the child was seven months old. The history was poor and uninterrupted interrupted urinary stream with febrile UTIs. So the child went down south to some institute where they did a right end urethrostomy and circumcision. But the child had, we don't have any pictures during that time. But apparently, the MCU shows that there's a bilateral gross hydroureter, I mean, gross viewer with a bad bladder. 2013, the same institute, they went for a left ureterostomy. 
MCU at that point of time shows a small capacity bladder that was as per the description. We don't have the plates with bilateral VUR into the distal ureteric stumps at 10 ml. Only after 10 ml of filling, there is bilateral VUR. Now both the ureters are diverted. Now in 2019, the left ureterostomy was closed. There was postoperative leakage, which was managed by putting a stent, which was later removed. Now, creatinine was stable, but on a higher side during all these periods. And the ultrasound showed bilateral moderate hydronephrosis after this closure, 2019. And creatinine was 1.7. So creatinine varied between 1.3 to 1.7 during this entire period. Now, in 2020, in the same institute, right ureteric reimplantation was done with appendicular mitrophenol. And the child was parents were shown how to do that and the parents were doing it. But possibly sometimes what we explain, the prognosis we explain to the parents, they don't like. They are not, that's not up to their best sort of expectation. It doesn't match their expectation. So they, parents went to a second institute also in the south of our country and what they did here, uh, so Basically, the child was on nighttime drainage, catheter drainage till about a year back, and the child was stable with the creatinine. With all this entire management in that institute, the child was stable. So what happened in 2022? There was bilateral gross hydronephrosis, hydroureter, and mild irregular bladder outline. That was the picture. Once again, we don't have the plates. And UDS was normal as per their study in the second hospital. What that surgeon did was, he pulled out the mitrophana. He said, all these are rubbish. Don't need to do it. The child is voiding very well. So you go ahead. So they were parents were extremely happy. They came back to Calcutta and now presented to our clinic with vomiting and a creatinine of 3.5 milligrams per cent. In that six months, in that six months of stopping CIC, the so now the child passes urine in good stream. There is no any resist, wakes up one to two times at night. Parents are very happy the way we don't need to do mitrophanov, we don't need to, but you know, doctor, the creatinine is going up. So that's that's how things are. So what we did is catheterization, we did a catheterization for seven days. In seven days, creatinine came down to 2.5. And ultrasound became normal from a gross bilateral hydronephrosis hydrator became normal. So what we did was we clamped the catheter and repeated the ultrasound maybe after one hour. And in, in that one hour, we find that there was bilateral severe hydronephrosis hydroureter with tortuous ureters by the same sonologist. And we have a APD dilatation. So hydronephrosis transverse uh, APD I mean, dilators from the right kidney to the 28, left kidney to the 26. And the Euroflow, but Euroflow was good. And there was good index, Euroflow index. So, we did a, uh, basically urodynamic study and compliance is normal. You see the absolutely stable bladder. There is no overactivity at all, normal sensation, no leak, nothing. But there is something very, very significant. Now, this, during this entire flow, you find that the EMG activity is severe, like totally high. It's, the plateau. it's never coming down. So, okay, so basically, so our point of thing is, uh, here what we found was the child who had a bladder issue, that's a natural suspicion dysanergy from day one. Now, during the period when he was advised CIC, and uh, that was, of course, a good way to deal with it. But it was something which was missed and previously reported normal urodynamic study. And Possibly this entire thing started from his infancy with this basic problem, with the bladder, issue, issue was with the bladder, not with the ureter. So, I mean, basically this case was to demonstrate the entire spectrum you have to keep in mind before you, we start managing a patient and the long-term outcome also should be in our front. So we all know this is a, whether it's a lion or it's a human being, we don't know. So this is a avatar. We know that there are hybrid lesions too. So we are getting 
more and more patients. We have now three patients in our follow-up who had a posterior valve as well as a neurogenic bladder. So they may remain together. So that is just to uh, uh, make one uh, sensitized to this fact that it's possible. Now, we can just relate to this story. This was a one-year, nine-month male child. At one year, three months, he had his posterior thal valve fulgurated along with bladder neck incision at a different hospital. The child had history of poor urinary stream before the surgery with recurrent episodes of UTI. Before he underwent fulguration, he had three episodes of UTI, febrile UTI. Once again, we don't have the uh, parents had lost this picture of this MCU, but apparently it was mentioned that posterior thal valve. After that, what happens? Now, we saw this child six months after this fulguration. In the meantime, the child presently passes urine in small amounts and dribbles at small intervals. And during sleep, sometimes he wets his pants, but it's not known. The parents are not that educated to, I mean, they, they can't exactly relate, tell, tell us what's there. Now, even after this fulguration and BNI, he had three episodes of febrile UTI. At present, when we first saw the child, the child had bilateral hydronephrosis with hydroureter and a thick walled trabeculated bladder. The urinary bladder wall was 3.9 millimeters and the post void residue was 24 cc. So that's how the bladder looked. Now, this is a classical inverted fur tree appearance and uh, there are multiple diverticuli as well. So the point is, whenever we have such a child, it might be, we might have a, a, a dilated posterior urethra, but often uh, a neurogenic bladder urethra often looks like a posterior urethral valve. So in these cases, it's always safer to rule out any neurological issue. Apparently, although the spine might look normal, we advise, this is a, a, a UDS. Of course, this is very important. Now, you see, this is, Compliance is a hayway, going hayway. It's going to 36, 41, and the flow is so minimal. At 48 ml of filling, bladder filling, I mean, urinary flow, you find 41 centimeter of water. So <clears throat> we did an MR spine where we find a lipoma with a tethered cord. So the child underwent detethering, was on indwelling catheter for a month, and then started on CIC and anticholinic. Now, four months down the line, now the child is having a CIC diary of almost 100 to 200 ml every four hours, three and a half hours, three to four hours. And maximum daytime has volume has increased up to 250, 300. The leakage has completely stopped. And in the last few months after the surgery and after this bladder therapy, urotherapy was started, there has been no episode of UTI. The child is gaining weight. So that's all about the thing. So, your, I mean, your eyes cannot see what your mind does not know. So always keep your mind open to all these possibilities. So even if you feel on cystoscopy that there is a valve, it might as well, may not be, there could be something else. So this is a aerodynamics now, which is almost, has almost reached baseline, but still there is reduced compliance and there is mild overactivity after 80 ml of pain. Now we come to the last part of our uh, deliberation, that's neurogenic bladder. Now, uh, there are many approaches to a neurogenic bladder. We believe in aggressive approach. Now, there are certain myths in literature or in uh, prevalent uh, belief of pediatric surgeons and pediatric ebolas. One of the myths is in a reflux, in a high-grade reflux, uh, urodynamics doesn't help because all the uh, dye goes to the ureters, doesn't reflect the bladder pressure. Myth number two is that in small children, we cannot do urodynamic study or urodynamic study is not, uh, uh, actually doesn't give you enough information because all children have overactive bladder. That's a normal evolution. Uh, so these are certain myths. Now we will try to, uh, uh, actually this is a talk which we, uh, we, all, uh, we also shared in our AIMS meet. So, uh, Let's come case by case. So this is our first patient. 
This is a follow-up case of lumbar sacral myelomeningocele. Now, which was repaired at the age of 13 days in the year 2000. And now he is 33 years. So he has been in CIC, on CIC for neurogenic bladder since 2003. Now, for the reflux, uh, someone had in, injected reflux in 2005 and again re, re injection at 2014, cured the reflux. Then in 2014, when the deflux failed, the child had undergone bilateral ureteric reimplantation. Child doesn't have any UTI and no lower limb neurodeficit as of now. So now the child is 21 years old because this presentation was made two years back. At that time, the child was 21 years. He is on CIC five times in 24 hours, 500 to 6 ml and 600 ml each time, and there is no leakage. Ultrasound shows bilateral moderate hydronephrosis with cortical thinning. Both the ureters are moderately dilated. Bladder wall is trabeculated. Post void is 40 ml. Actually, there's no point in post void because the child is on CIC. Child complains of intermittent flank pain. Now, this particular, this one symptom actually should make you think twice why is he having flank pain? And this is something, and the creatinine is slowly creeping up. Somebody had said now the child is reaching adolescence, so maybe due to the increasing muscle mass, so you don't need to do anything, just observe. Now, this intermittent flank pain. Now, you see, this is the uh, aerodynamics. You can see a lot of overactivity is going on, going on, going on. And since these are the areas, since we did a, a video aerodynamics, I'll show you the video MCU pictures. Now, these are the occasions when the child had flank pains. So the point is, if there is no leakage, now this is another very uh, strange uh, phenomenon actually. Whenever a child does not leak, when the child if parents come to our clinic, when we ask, uh, is your child leaking? They will give, give a big smile and the mom says, I know the child is uh, it's, it's doing very well, the child does not leak. But actually, it's an ominous sign. We actually don't want the child to leak uh, rather, rather, leakage actually prevents upper tract damage in uh, neurogenic impaired children. So here we find in this particular uh, graph that there is a there are occasions where the child is having high pressure overactivity, and in those uh, now, as we were telling you before, in a this is a high grade reflux. If you look carefully during the initial part, first 400 ml, the bladder shape is unchanged. The bladder compliance is unchanged. In the, in the beginning of the study, bladder compliance is unchanged. It's rising when it is gradually failing. So basically, the first part of the study all goes to the upper tracts. And after 400 ml, then the bladder starts to grow. And it is then when you see the changes coming on the urodynamic curve. So if you do a video UDS, you will exactly know what is the scenario of the bladder? What is the dynamic state of the bladder when the ureter is he's having flank pain? What is the dynamic state when there is lack of compliance, loss of compliance? So basically, till 400 ml, most of the contrast gets accumulated in the upper tracts, masking poor compliance. So you may have in the initial, so you know exactly when you consider the urodynamic study to be pseudo or the false or not exactly reflecting the scenario. And when it is exactly reflecting the rise in the diffuser pressure. So, patient is dry, socially continent, parents are happy. But the point is this rising creatinine, persistent or recurrence of gross VUR, flank pain, mild bladder dysfunction on UDS, and abnormal appearance of the bladder on MCU. All these tell you that there is actually a lot that can be done. We can actually alter the clinical course. So this was not at all a role, low risk bladder. And without these bladder functional studies, you would have been actually happy as the parents were. So this is our second case. This is once again a myelomeningocele. 
which was operated previously. Now the child is having a creatinine of four milligram percent. You can see high grade reflux, uh, inverted first shape uh, bladder or tree shaped bladder. Here you see, uh, here this urodynamic study is showing at only 17 ml of volume is having a pressure of 74, an absolutely non compliant bladder. Now, this child was started on CIC, we started on pyridine, we started oxybutynin. So, this was a UDI, MCU and video UDS done three months later. Creatinine was four to begin with. Now the creatinine is 0.4. This has stabilized to a large extent. Then it was now it is even at 116 ml volume, it's only 23, it's still very high. And the bladder has improved, the reflux has improved. So the reflux improves after proper Achy, Achy, bladder management Achy. if it's a secondary case. So the parents continued CIC for two years. Uh, I think this is our... So uh, this is a child, uh, this is another child. So the child is having CIC every three hourly, 100 to 150 ml each time. And every 30 minutes, he passes urine voluntarily. So there is a frequency of exhibition despite of, but apparently the patient is dry, he doesn't leak. But for the last three months, he's having recurrent UTI, so he visited us. So this was the UDS, as you can find. So these were the areas of leakage. And each time you find that there is a high overactivity, burst of overactivity. The compliance is also going up. So this is the creatinine is 0.5. The right kidney uh, split renal function is 20%. So now the point is, uh, does really aerodynamics help in cases of a neurogenic bladder? and how we can actually uh, modify the outcome. So this was a three-year-old male child. This was once again a lumbar myelomeningocele was operated at birth. The child had bilateral lower limb weakness, flexion at hip and extension at knees. So difficult to lay, lay straight. Now dribbled urine continuously till the age of two years and passed small amounts of urine on prompting with straining. Now uh, remains dry for 20 to 30 minutes. And the rest of the time there was dribbling. And continuous dribbling at night, which I also was constipated. It's a typical presentation. Now, the symptoms were the child had recurrent UTI, ultrasound showed bilateral upper tract dilatation with a normal bladder and significant post void residue. And DMSA showed bilateral scars. So this was the picture. So you can see that the extent of uh, reflux, grade 5 reflux. So MCU showed a seemingly large bladder capacity. Bladder apparently was didn't look that bad. It was a rounded bladder with not much of uh, articulations or bladder reticuli. So we can start off CIC and wait. Now here the question is, really do we need investing in that? And how does it change the... Uh, a mode of treatment. Now, in the first half of healing phase, you can see that gradually the curve is going up. 10, 20, 15, 25. So, basically, with a filling of 138, the child has reached 35 centimeters of water. And this is the second half, which is going still higher. And in all these cases, we have leakages. So to sum up, basically, we have a child, three-year child, who has a normal capacity bladder, very poor compliance with overactivity, and the detrusor lift blood pressure is 30 to 35 centimeter at 150 to 170 ml volume. So the point is, previously, the studies used to say that 40 centimeters is a cutoff. Now we have found that there is continual deterioration of subtle deterioration of the renal function even beyond 20 centimeter of water. So we want the bladder pressure to be below 20. So this child was started on CIC, oil management, and 
anticholinergics. And follow-up assessment was done with CIC diary. We looked at the episodes of leakages, whether it is reduced or not, and dilatation on the ultrasound. And accordingly, we adjusted the dose of anticholinergics. So at one year, the CIC diary showed three to four hourly, the child was, we could uh, catheterize 150 to 175 ml, and there was no leakage in between. Whereas previously, the child was continually leaking at night and even during the day, every half an hour. Passes stool daily with washes, and ultrasound shows a mild right hydronephrosis, no hydronephrosis on the left, no ureteric dilatation, bladder wall come down to 3.4. The training was stable and there had been no episode of UTI. And this was a urodynamic problem. It's a filling systematic showing, and even the voiding pressures were low. This was a Video aerodynamics, this such a nice bladder, the reflux completely vanished. So, that is how we can actually monitor, prognosticate, and modify our medical management, the dosage, the type of medicine we are using with aerodynamic assessment periodically. Now, we have a second patient. This is another patient. With Managed in the infancy. The ultrasound shows uh, bilateral hydroerotonephrosis, thick wall urotary bladder, and there is multiple triangulations. is 0.4. Now, at only 140 ml volume, he is having a pressure of up to 50 centimeter water. Compliance has gone completely here. It is very much high. The star is going up. So, we started on oxybutynin and CIC. So one year later, we now have 18 centimeters. Previously, it was at 140 ml volume. We had a pressure going up to 40 to 50. Now at 200 ml volume, we have a pressure of 18. Now, as we already told you, we are actually not very compliant with whatever high pressure in the bladder there is. So we added Mirabegron to this child. and Three months later, this was the. We now we have at 270 ml, we have 6 centimeter of water. So basically, our aim in all cases of neurogenic bladder and non neurogenic neurogenics is mainly our primary aim is to preserve the renal function, whatever renal functions, as Dr. Sayan used to say in all the meetings, that all these unfortunate children are born with absolutely normal kidneys. So, it, the onus falls on us, the pediatricians and the pediatric surgeons, if there is deterioration of that full renal function with which the child is born. And with intervention, with assessment and medical intervention and surgical intervention, whenever needed, we can actually reduce the renal mobility to almost zero in all the neurogenic cases, at least. So, we can go to any extent. We can use Botox, we can use medicines, whatever we want. We should try to achieve a low pressure bladder with uh, compliance. Now, compliance, if we need, we may need to uh, go for augmentation and all. But whatever, uh, so basically, the summary, if we summarize whatever uh, I tried to discuss over the last few minutes, is that uh, no workup in most of our kids with pediatric urological problems is complete without bladder assessment. Bladder assessment does not always need fancy studies. History taking, proper history taking, looking at the urinary flow, clinical examination diligently, and a uroflowmetry and a bladder diary. These are the basics which can uh, actually, we can arrive at a diagnosis, working diagnosis in more than 70% of our patients with these uh, things in our armament area. Especially if it's posterior valve, neurogenic bladder and bowel, bowel bladder bowel disorders, and we work, bladder evaluation really plays an important role. And especially in neurogenic bladder, uh, uh, rectal washes, which sometimes parents are reluctant to do, can actually make a lot of difference in the ultimate outcome. Because we all know that uh, there is a lot of crosstalk between the rectum and the bladder. And if the rectum is loaded, however well you treat the bladder, is going to be a, a complete failure. So you have to insist on uh, uh, the rectal washes for the children. And if needed, you can add a ACE procedure. 
many of our patients who are quite comfortable with rectal washes when they grow beyond a certain age prefer uh, placing of a, a an anti-grade continence enema mechanism and they are happy with giving the wash and that actually gives them a lot of independence as well. Now, urodynamic study, especially video urodynamics, I would encourage everyone of which uh, whoever uh, are doing urodynamic study to just try to uh, get hold of even you, if you cannot manage a C-arm, you can uh, uh, use your fluoroscope which you uh, in a radiology room and you can shift your aerodynamic apparatus to the radiology room and simultaneously do the two things so that that gives you an exact one is to one dynamic visualization of the functional and structural issues. And uh, I think uh, uh, with the words which, uh, which I started the talk, some amongst us, especially the youngsters who have, because it actually needs a lot of time. You need to devote a lot of time. Aerodynamics is not just uh, uh, just uh, do and get away, not like that. You have to devote a lot of time, only then you will have findings. You have, you'll have wonderful findings, which will actually uh, uh, have a lot of uh, effect on your total management. It will guide you fantastically in your uh, planning of management. And uh, we always look forward to collaborative studies from pediatric urologists and pediatric surgeons across the country and across the globe. And I think with the huge numbers of patients we have in our country, uh, if we collate all the studies, it will be uh, the statistics will be something which is mind boggling. And we can actually make a lot of breakthrough in whatever conventional way we uh, think about managing all these complex patients. And these are some of our recent publications uh, in Journal of Pediatric Urology and uh, our own journal. Uh, I, I would request everyone to share their thoughts and uh, criticisms, whatever, so that we can go forward. And uh, that's our uh, Calcutta. And thank you, everyone, for, for our patient hearing. Thank you. Uh, Subhashish, thank you very much. That was a very, very uh, authoritative, very nice presentation. And it's amazing that you have so such careful documentation of patients and some of the images, how the bladder has changed with what sort of is simple management of just pharmacotherapy uh, and diligence, uh, you know, has made remarkable difference to the way the bladder appears. And I think the pictures, as they say, talk, talk thousands of words. And I think you have all those pictures very well documented. A very, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. I will just take a few questions that are on the chat and then, you know, we can open it for comments and discussions from people directly. Uh, yeah, I think... I Akshay just, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, if uh, uh, Dr. Poonam also can be uh, uh, taken into... Uh, this, is she... Uh, is, if, if she's online, otherwise uh, we can... Yeah, Poonam is online. Yeah, yeah. She, is, she, is, she is online. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. Please, uh, uh, you can... Yeah, so I, the question is, uh, how do you perform voiding pressures in children as the catheter itself can cause obstruction to urine flow <laughs> in small children? Yeah, I, this I would uh, request Dr. Poonam to answer because uh, he's just published one article on, on this. Poonam, could you please come on and if you have your camera, yeah. you could probably put it on so we can see you. Yeah, please go ahead. We can see you. Please go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shama, for the very nice presentation that has shown all the patients. Uh, so actually, uh, regarding the voiding pressures in children, uh, uh, all the pediatric literature does not stress upon the voiding pressures at all. But the adult literature does stress upon the voiding pressures because there are uh, many nomograms, many formula that they have created to assess whether there is output at obstruction or not. Uh, uh, the thing is that in adults also, the uh, studies are done with the catheter in situ. So taking idea from that, we started studying pressures in the uh, children, boys and girls both, voiding pressures. And actually what we have found is that the voiding pressures, uh, if we are using a standard six French catheter, we are using for all the kids. So with that catheter, actually the um, maximum voiding pressures are not changing for uh, with the age. age. Uh, the, we are measuring P date at QMAX, that is the retrosal pressure at maximum uh, flow rate. If you measure that, then we are seeing that that is not varying much with age. Uh, so, uh, although the catheter is there in the urethra, but if we standardize the pressures in the presence of the catheter, and we can, do, if we can do the uh, studies, suppose in the known patients of uh, output tract obstruction, suppose before with the obstruction in situ and after the obstruction has been treated. In that way, we can get a, uh, a pressure range 
uh, which can be seen in presence of obstruction as well as once the obstruction has been reduced. So that will give us a good idea. Uh, that's what we have seen in the last few, in the last few years. Uh, I have one thing, oh, one more, one more thing to add. Basically, uh, there is something called the Euroflow index, which can be done with a free Euroflow. So if we perform a free Euroflow with an EMG on, that will give us a fair idea about the. I mean, uh, the Euroflow itself gives us an idea about the obstruction. So if you have any doubt that a catheter is causing some issue, we can go for a free Euroflow with an EMG and calculate the Euroflow index. That will give us a fair idea. Uh, is there any age-wise cutoff for bladder compliance? Uh, I don't think there is any standardization as of yet. But basically, uh, compliance should be... Uh, uh, now, normally, as uh, we have been traditionally taught that for the first year, one year, uh, the first uh, across the first year, first few months, the bladder is non-compliant, which gradually grows and uh, gains compliance. So. The cutoff is one year. I think up to one year, uh, high compliance per se doesn't uh, tell us that it's a pathological thing. So beyond one year, gradually, if it's a non-compliant, and actually there are uh, everything has to be taken together. Like in the uh, ultrasound, if it's a thick walled bladder, now uh, even a non-compliant bladder in an infant should not be thick walled. So in uh, with an optimal distension, it should have a measurement of. Uh, around two, below two millimeters, uh, it should not be, there should not be trabeculation. So telltale signs of compliance uh, are there. It, it, it's not only on the chart. Right. Uh, what, uh, when to start tol uh, alone and when in combination with oxybutynin, uh, how do you decide is the question uh, from Dr. Sarda. Yeah, tolterodine, uh, say solifenacine, tolterodine. Now, these uh, drugs have not been, uh, the safety profile is not uh, clearly demarcated in any of the uh, guidelines anywhere in the world below three to four years. So in children, young children, we start with uh, uh, oxybutynin. Now, mirabegron has been used. Uh, there have been a couple of studies where mirabegron has been used beyond uh, two years. Uh, but uh, especially solifenacin is uh, hardly, there is any description of safety below 8 to 10 years, solifenacin. And tolterodine has been used two years onwards, two, two years onwards. But up to two years, I think oxybutynin is the safest. And uh, that is, uh, uh, now we have to keep in mind one thing, that oxybutynin also causes a lot of constipation. So uh, we are very comfortable using oxybutynin in neurogenics because neurogenic bladder patients are always on rectal washes. So the amount of constipation that is contributed by oxybutynin is balanced by the rectal washes. So and uh, so we can really well use. And there is a question about antibiotic prophylaxis in all children with CIC, with or without reflux. Uh, what do you do? Uh, we uh, do not put all, uh, actually, up to five years, we put all children with CIC on prophylaxis. Beyond five years, even with CIC, there is colonization. There is always a bacterial colonization. Past cells are always like this, sometimes like this, sometimes. But if their culture doesn't show significant growth, then we don't read any, uh, we don't consider it as EPA. And up to five years, all children with CIC are on prophylaxis. Beyond five years, we, uh, that's not the must. Uh, okay, then it, there's a question about, uh, you know, compliance with CIC and how do you motivate your families? Uh, yeah. uh, so, especially, is... uh, yeah, yeah, this is a very important thing. And I think uh, we all, all uh, are of the feeling that the parents are most susceptible psychologically and emotionally when the child is first born. So whenever a child uh, comes to us or born in our center or refer to us in a newborn stage with myelopeninosis especially, we teach them, we teach the parents, especially mom, how to do the CIC on day one of our consultation. So, so that the fear goes away, the apprehension goes away. And once the mom is comfortable doing it, uh, then uh, we, say, I mean, we don't put all children on CIC, of course, but uh, if it's needed later on, the best time to sensitize the mom is just at birth and just at a very young age. And uh, I would say, 
we demonstrate it repeatedly ourselves. And we, uh, in, our, uh, in our clinic, the parents themselves do, and we guide them, and we have videos to share with them, and they keep con contacting us. And, it, and most of our parents are very compliant in this case. I mean, apparently, it is contradictory to many of the observations of our colleagues, uh, as we see on the WhatsApp messages. But uh, in our experience, most of our parents are very compliant. Uh, there is a question about diversion. So, were any of the patients with very trabeculated bladders offered diversion? Do you think that it would help stabilize the bladder? Yeah, of course, diversion is a is a is a uh, option is an option. But the only thing is, like the children, I I mean, like the child we described, if both the ureters are diverted, at least one should be uh, ruin y or uh, uh, whatever. I mean, uh, we need the bladder to cycle. So that, 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 that's one of the issues. And second is, since there are uh, so many options today, at one point of time, say uh, in 2007, 8, 9, uh, uh, we didn't have many options. So we actually did, uh, went for diversion at the drop of a hat. But now we often, we, can, we are able to stabilize the child medically with medications, with uh, injection Botox. Uh, in the bladder, in the sphincter, in the bladder neck. Uh, so there are options. Uh, and uh, we have also uh, gone with uh, laser incision of the bladder neck in one or two very resistant uh, children. And in the way we could do away with diversion, but diversion is of course uh, one of the options on our chart and we sometimes have to resort to diversion. Uh, that's the questions that I have on chat. Uh, uh, would anybody want to uh, discuss anything directly? Please unmute yourself or raise your hand. And uh, uh, Dr. Bharti Kulkarni is online. Madam, would you would you like to add comment? Uh, Excellent presentation. I enjoyed it thoroughly, and congratulations. I, I think much. all postgraduates should take advantage of such uh, lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Anybody else wants to make a comment or uh, share a share a experience or <clears throat> ask a question? Lakshmi? Uh, yes, I would like to just ask about the child who, can you hear me? Yeah, you're yeah. audible, you're audible, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'd like to ask about the child who had the atonic bladder and you had expressed about various options. I think there was a second or the third child um, uh, yeah. who wasn't widening yeah. at all and just had the, uh, from the uterostomy she was draining. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, do you, do you inject Botox into the bladder neck for her? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, it, it's not actually an atonic bladder because the urodynamics shows a lot of activity. I mean, muscle, there is activity of the muscle, but because of the uh, contour, uh, distorted contour of the urethra and severe spasm of the uh, perineal muscle, I mean, sphincter, and a spasm at the bladder neck, uh, hypertrophy of the bladder neck, she's not able to void to completion. Okay. Or rather void at all at one point of time. Now we had done a dilatation and uh, injection Botox at the bladder neck and the sphincter. That was what we did. And she has, a, of course, a urethrostomy. So now she's able to, now it has been around five months, six months. So now she's able to void at times from below. So we have scheduled one more uh, one more sitting of cystoscopy and uh, dilatation as well as giving a Botox. And of course, she's on alpha blockers. So it's not exactly a tonic bladder. She has a uh, bladder, bladder tone is intact. And uh, whenever mm -hmm. the bladder is contracting, it's going up the ureter. That's the issue. And, and her MRI was normal, is it? Her MRI yeah, yeah, was... yeah, 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 yeah. Spine is absolutely normal. Very so interesting. Because because I have a girl yeah. who's sort of behaving like that. And, yeah. uh, you know, we're just scratching our heads as to what to do. She's a much older girl. So I was just wondering what was the effect of the Botox on the bladder neck and no, no, it, 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 it was very good. The only, only issue was uh, because even we could not catheterize the child in the beginning. It was so much tortuous. So we had to go in with cystoscope, put a guide wire and then catheterize. So that child was extremely uh, apprehensive and didn't allow any cic for the for the parents so now mm -hmm. she is allowing at times once or twice catheterization we are going to take advantage of that situation and we want to dilate again and maybe put on uh, some uh, local steroid ointment and cic for the parents twice or thrice like that 
Mm. So how long did the Botox effect last? Is it six months? Like <laughs> for three, four months, it is very nice. Beyond four months, it gradually comes down. But we mm. have had children with neurogenics who had, uh, where we put Botox in the bladder, uh, the function, I mean, uh, the relaxation staying on beyond seven months, eight months as well. Oh, okay. Very interesting. Loved your talk. It was very good. Yeah, thank you. You are muted, Dr. Rao. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes. Any more Any more questions? Does anybody else want to make a point or raise a question? Uh, VVS, go come on. Like. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sanjay. Um, Subhasis, thank you so much. I, I think I missed the initial part of your talk, but uh, I heard uh, the later part where you discussed a lot of interesting cases. It was very nice. Uh, uh, I think one comment regarding Botox. Yeah, I think uh, Botox, although the effect might go away after six or nine months, but by the time the bladder would have relaxed yeah. and then, you know, yeah. would be holding more urine. So that sometimes yeah. continues uh, for uh, for longer time. So we should not actually think that every six or nine months we will need to inject. Yeah, Some yeah. of these bladders, they, you know, they actually, you know, um, they, they relax and then they become larger and start holding more urine at lesser uh, pressures. Yeah. And this actually yeah. continues even after the so-called Botox effect wears off. Yeah. And that's one more, thing. yeah. Well, one more thing is just to add to this: in severe bad neuro, neuro, neurogenic bladders, you can actually give, injecting Botox actually helps you in reducing the dose of anticholinergic. You don't need that high dose. Second thing um, about oxybutynin, I think uh, anybody who is actually prescribing oxybutynin routinely, I think most of us are doing it. Uh, should read one uh, interesting article in Journal of Pediatric Urology, Fat, Demented and Stupid. Okay. This is the name of the article. Don't go by the name. It's a yeah. very interesting article. Basically, it discusses the adverse effects of all the so-called uh, uh, urological or bladder medications that we use routinely. I mean, yeah. uh, so the first, probably the first lesson is we should not start any of these medications without a proper indication. Right. You know, just because there is a post valve, you fulgurated the valve, you just can't put the child on oxybutynin, a small baby on oxybutynin. Uh, because oxybutynin uh, has a lot of side effects and uh, a lot of neurologic side effects and uh, neuropsychiatric, whatever side effects, behavioral modifications. So we should be very careful. That's the, probably one of the take-home messages uh, that the youngsters at least need to know. And last question, Subhas, is have you... In your practice, encountered primary bladder neck hypertrophy causing a bladder rounded obstruction in boys. Uh, yes. Most mostly in girls. Uh, yet to get one in a boy. <laughs> yeah, I think we have seen a couple of patients. We'll probably present it in one of the bladder meetings. Yeah. yeah. But it's yeah. interesting. I mean, I still can't believe that that is the cause. Yeah. But then uh, all the other things uh, lead me to believe I mean, with, that with the, with the spine normal. Yes, with the spine normal. Oh, right. right. Post with the yes. normal spine normal, it looks like a primary bladder neck hypertrophy causing obstruction and then behaving just like to how a post with the valve would behave. Right. I think, right. Uh, yeah, it would be interesting to discuss. Thank yeah, you so yeah. much. Thank you once yeah, again. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just had one um, question really here. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. Please Sir, with all this uh, pharmacology that you're using, what is yeah. your um, requirement for augments in these patients? How often do you really need to do an augment? Uh, now it's much lesser because previously we used to, uh, I mean, uh, prescribe augmentation uh, in, I mean, quite a few patients. But now uh, it's coming down. I mean, like in, in our practice, we used to prescribe, say, three to four augments in a year. We, we don't see that volume. But now I think, the last augmentation we had advised uh, a year back. So it, it is, of, of course, mm -hmm. less. And well, augmentation I mean, comes my, with its own That's problems. my impression, too. That's my yeah. impression, too. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further questions, uh, comments? Anybody else wants to come online? Please free to unmute, switch on video, and speak, comment, talk, ask. 
Okay. If not, I think then uh, we will we will call it a day. Uh, uh, Subhashish, thank you very much for a very very lovely talk. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, sort of voice disturbance. Uh, you know, okay. so there was some fading coming in and out. Uh, but okay. otherwise, uh, it, all the presentation and the slides, everything moved excellently. So thank you very much. It was a very okay. very informative talk, and uh, thank you very much from all our behalf. Uh, this Thank will you, go sir. on to YouTube in a few days' time. So those of uh, yeah. you who have missed can, you know, we can always go back and see this there on YouTube. So Subhashish, thank you very much, and thank uh, you, thank you. good night to thank all of you all, and especially night. those in the northern parts of our country. Please stay safe, and we hope yeah. that you know the weather and things start to improve quickly. Thank you, and good night all. Thank you. Good night.